This is Dog Storian. Stories about dogs. And their people. And related species. Like cats. And this is me, Justina. And this is me, Brian. Oh. Meow. There's something bothering me. Uh-oh. So far we've been talking only about pet dogs. That's why they were made. But there's another group of dogs, which is very important, and we should talk about it. Show dogs? Mm-mm. Working dogs? Nope. Imaginary friend type dogs? You'll see. Thank you, Anindita, for finding time to chat with us today. And let's start with an introduction, maybe. Could you tell what is your background and what you do now? So I'm a behavioral biologist by training. I did my PhD on, in animal behavior. I used to work on uh, a paper wasp, so a social insect. And uh, when people ask me, what did you do? I typically say I used to work on wasp politics because uh, I was uh, basically working on this problem to understand uh, how the succession works in these wasp societies because these are uh, primitive societies with uh, not a pre-designated queen. Uh, so it's, uh, it's quite interesting dynamics. And uh, after my PhD, which I did in the Indian Institute of Science in uh, Bangalore, uh, the south of India, I was kind of thinking of what next to do. So in India, you know, there is this uh, notion that you either have to do your PhD and postdoc abroad and then you come back wise. Or even if you do a PhD in the country, you definitely have to go to one of the first world countries to, you know, get some extra wisdom and experience. Otherwise, you're not good enough to be hired as a faculty member. And uh, when I was doing my PhD, I had my uh, son. So he was uh, one year old the day I submitted my thesis. So it was a big decision, you know, whether I and my, my husband was already uh, working uh, here. So uh, what do we do, whether we move as a family, split up the family? And I was in two minds. And uh, this is when my supervisor said, you know, there are these new institutions, two of them which have started in India. And uh, they are really hiring a lot of people. So why don't you, st you know, try applying there? I said, well, uh, the norm is uh, three years of post-PhD experience for a faculty position, so they'll not take me. He said, no, they're also taking people, uh, uh, you know, freshly out of their PhDs on contractual positions. And then you kind of prove yourself and uh, get uh, a tenure. So you might try. So then uh, I said, okay. And that's when I started thinking that if I have my own lab, what do I want to work on? <laughs> the moment for dogs. I have always loved dogs. India, we have street dogs everywhere. Even as a kid, I used to, you know, go out and feed them biscuits and stuff. Wait, what? Biscuits? So in India, people typically feed biscuits to dogs. You just buy a packet of biscuit uh, uh, buy from a roadside stall and feed it to the dogs. I have always been, uh, you know, fascinated by the fact that dogs will just come approach you, wag their tail and expect to be petted. That's when I was like, okay, why don't I work on dogs? And I was reading up a lot of dog literature in general because I was also interested in cognition. I realized that a lot of interesting work is happening on dogs, but uh, it's all on pet dogs in a lab environment. Having grown up among dogs all my life, I often used to think, you know, People are saying that this is what dogs can do and this is what dogs are like. But how do they know that it's not because of the influence of the owner or, you know, how they've been uh, brought up in a family? So what about the dogs which uh, don't have uh, humans to take care of them, who are struggling for survival, who have, you know, a natural habitat? Because they're out there competing with other dogs, competing with other scavengers. They're uh, getting killed by road accidents. They're uh, getting, uh, you know, aggression from humans. Th th there's a lot of ha things happening right out there and nobody has really studied them. Yeah, that's true. I guess in many countries, stray dogs are simply not around, which means that pet dogs are the only ones that researchers have access to. Did you have any other animal candidates for your research? I was also interested in working on crows. So I actually wrote up two proposals, one on crows and one on dogs, because I didn't know which I wanted to do finally. And I actually took it to my PhD supervisor and I said, why don't you tell me which is better? Then he said, uh, OK, which which is, uh, you know, more interesting to you? And I said, both. So <laughs> Well, naturally, it's a tough choice between those two. We kind of, both of us, after a discussion, we concluded it's going to be very difficult to identify crows. You have to catch them and tag them. And, in, uh, you know, they live in all kinds of, uh, you know, high places and high trees, and they're not very friendly uh, creatures. And uh, it'll be very difficult to get students to do that. 
I very clearly now imagine a poor freshman climbing up a tree, shaking with fear of heights, thinking why he didn't study law. That's kind of what shifted me to the final decision of dogs. That's how I started. So when I joined, so currently I'm an associate professor at uh, Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Kolkata. So that's where I have uh, spent all my independent career uh, as a faculty. Uh, it's been 11 years now. Uh, since I started. But uh, in addition to doing the science, I also do a lot of outreach because that's something I'm really passionate about. You know, I go and do programs with kids in schools, remote areas. I often go and tell them how you can, you know, just hang around in your garden and do science by observing nature. That's really wonderful. We definitely need more projects like that everywhere. So that's kind of one of the things that I do. Um, I'm also engaged with organizations like in India, I founded the Indian National Young Academy of Science uh, six years ago. I was its founding chair and now I'm an alumnus. I've been a member of the Global Young Academy. With that, we do a lot of science policy, talking about uh, diversity, open science, speaking out for the perspective of young scientists, and a lot of outreach, spreading the passion of science. So that's kind of uh, what I do in my professional life. What an admirable collection. I am a fan immediately, really. Maybe we could start with a little bit of history. For me, it is quite hard to picture the life of stray dogs in cities, because in my home country, Lithuania, there's very few dogs on the streets nowadays. And in Germany, where I live now, there's zero stray dogs. Could you maybe describe how dogs got to be strays in India and what the current situation is? People call them stray dogs, but I think they should not be called stray dogs. Why is that? If you read the literature, it goes back to the earliest uh, you know, literature in India, the epics that we have, uh, we have an epic called uh, Mahabharata, which is uh, very old, you know, goes back to 900 to 1200 years before from now. And, uh, you know, it's like it was an oral tradition, stories passed down and then got written at a different period of time. So I'm a bit confused about the time periods all the time. But anyway, so if you go back to any of our uh, old literature, you would find mentions of dogs on streets. So even in the what is now considered as a religious text, it was never written as a religious text, more like, you know, the Vedas in India are now very famous. So the earliest Veda is the Rig Veda, which has a whole section on dogs. You know, there is a mother of dogs and she she gets a curse and her uh, you know offspring become dogs, basically. So there, there's a story how dogs came into being in, in that sense. And uh, you already see this connection of, you know, this expectation of somehow deviation from humans to become dogs, something like that in this uh, story. And then in the Rig Veda you have, it kind of gives outlines or uh, a kind of framework of what uh, life should be in the sense that how do you lead a good life so that, you know, you earn brownie points with the gods. And one of this is when you are a householder, one of your duties is to, you know, put out all the leftovers after a meal, not you know, feed anyone inside the house, but take all the leftovers and go outside to the street corner and put it out there for the scavengers to feed on. And the scavengers are crows and dogs. And unfortunately, they also include a class of humans because in India, we already had this notion of, you know, castes. So the what were considered the lowest of the castes who were like really kind of the scavengers of society, the three people, Three uh, kind of uh, animals mentioned are dogs, crows, and the chandals, or the lowest caste in the society. Pretty clear structure, indeed. So I think dogs have lived like this in this uh, region of the world for centuries. So they are not really strays. That's why I always say free-ranging dogs, because these are natural populations which have just been there. And in India, we did not really have the notion of pets for a long, long time. So we have some indigenous breeds, but these breeds are all dogs which have been bred uh, by royalty for hunting mostly. Other than that, even in the, the Mughal kings, some of them owned dogs, which they took out for hunting. But common people never had pets. Having a pet is a very, very foreign notion, which actually came to India with the British. Ah, yeah, of course. So 
household pets in you know in regular families is a very modern concept even you know my grandparents they used to look down upon people who had pets at home you know that their generation my grandmother used to have dogs so you know a lot of her uh, relatives did not like visiting them then oh you keep a dog in the house they're dirty so she uh, of course had these uh, breeds so she had uh, alsatians so i have heard from her that Uh, people thought it was uh, how, how can you keep an you know a dog inside the house it climbs onto your bed and you know you sits and uh, you eats next to you that's not done it's dirty so the indian concept of pets is a very very recent concept and uh, dogs have always been there we also have lots of cats but more of dogs than cats i find it very unfortunate now that there's a lot of uh, opposition to having stray animals and especially dogs because they're so visible and they bark cats you hardly see right they'll come steal your food and go away but you don't really see them that much but dogs you see them and you hear them all the time so people are very anti dog sometimes and i always try telling uh, you know people around me that we have always had a culture of coexistence so the scavengers are there they're part of society the general frame work and now suddenly we have this notion i have often heard people say you go to the us you go to european countries you don't see stray dogs why do we need stray dogs on our streets but that's been the culture right they they have always been there so when people say you know oh poor dog it lives on the footpath and like that's where it belongs you came and built the footpath and you came there with your cars but the dogs have been there forever and actually if you think about it they have evolved in a sense of cultural evolution with us they have adjusted their lives uh, from bullock carts to horse carts to uh, motorized vehicles to trains they have undergone all of this and they have survived if the dogs have been community dogs so to speak for centuries and not just house pets why do they stay so social towards humans i mean is it just because of food or for example cats are not that social or <laughs> i mean i'm a cat fan not social in the same way i know it's a complicated question biologically but do you have any theories i think it's a mixed thing firstly dogs are by nature more social than cats so cats are so the fel- felines are more solitary animals and the canids are more social animals you know the, if you just look at the family tree uh, in the phylogenetic tree so i think by nature dogs are more social the notion that you know that dog researchers now have i think that they have undergone this evolution from wolf like uh, ancestors to dog like ancestors through a process of domestication and my pet theory uh, more goes with the idea that you know humans would be sitting around a fire and you know feeding on their latest hunt and there would be some docile wolves hanging around for the scraps and uh, that would have started some kind of a community level association and then if you are kind of uh, a wolf low down in the hierarchy where you'd only get the scraps out of the hunt of your pack and then you get more juicy bones thrown out to you by the humans you eventually leave your pack and start following the humans it doesn't seem like a very difficult transition to happen yeah sometimes it pays off to be lazy and just wait for food coming to you and if that is so then there is already a socialization towards humans which is there in the ancestral dogs so that's one thing secondly what i have experienced in my 11 years of work here is there are free ranging dogs which are not so social if you go to more remote areas where there are fewer humans in fact just uh, last week we have published a paper in uh, the journal of comparative uh, psychology where we show that If you go and check out on the approachability and sociability response of dogs in uh, we've uh, kind of divided uh, regions based on human flux so how many humans or vehicles will pass by if you do stand in a spot and do a census and uh, we basically have three kind of zones one is a very low flux zone which is either a completely quiet neighborhood or you know a, a kind of fringe areas in the towns and cities where there's a highway next to it and then uh, there are a few houses so not too many humans would pass by uh, then you have kind of uh, neighborhoods mixed with a few shops a grocery shop you know maybe an eatery and then few houses or uh, or maybe a few office buildings so kind of a, a mixed bag of things and then we have very crowded places like big markets bus stations railway stations and what we saw is that 
dogs in these three zones behave very differently when a stranger comes and approaches them. So typically you call out to a dog, a dog will either wag its tail and approach you or run away. So what were those differences exactly? Interestingly, the dogs which encounter fewer humans, which are in the low flux zones, typically don't approach when you call out to them, even when you offer them food. Dogs in the high flux zones do not come to you if you call them. The moment you drop a food, they'll come grab the food and go away. So they are more opportunistic, but they would typically avoid strangers unless there is a reward. The ones in the intermediate flux zones, which is more, more or less the community neighborhood dogs, these are the friendliest, the boldest. You call them, they'll come wagging their tail. You give them food, they'll again come wagging their tail. So there is definitely a behavioral difference, which is basically based on their life experiences. Depending on what kind of humans they have interacted and what kind of interactions they have received from humans. So there is a lot of uh, variation even at the level of the population. So I think to answer your question, definitely food is a factor. Second is the experience they have with humans and typically neighborhood dogs will receive, uh, you know, both affection and food from some humans. But of course, there would be people who would uh, throw stones at them and chase them with a stick. But I guess it's kind of whether the positive is higher and the negative is higher and also their history of evolution. I think all of these three play a very important role in determining whether they remain socialized to humans. And of course, there is this other thing that, you know, Dogs which are very aggressive typically will get beaten, will get chased away, will not get food from the humans. So evolutionary speaking, it is in their advantage to be socialized towards humans and be nice and friendly rather than to be aggressive or stealthy and to move away. And here dogs are very, very, very good at begging. I've even seen dogs who will sit at a tea stall and uh, they'll be just sitting there and then somebody is eating they'll gradually move close to them and give them the soulful look. Even if it has been just fed, it'll again give this very soulful look and then eventually this person will say, okay, fine, I'll give you a biscuit. They do this very well. I've even seen dogs which will come and paw you and then give you this look. And so they are very good beggars. That's another thing, you know, it's advantages to be timid and friendly and uh, you get more food. Oh, yes, I definitely wanted to go in this direction and touch on domestication. Because in one of your articles, I think I read that free-ranging dogs can help to understand it better. What I am interested in besides this also is the structure of packs of these free-ranging dogs. If you can even call it packs, of course. How do they organize themselves? Packs, uh, when we write about them, because we haven't really seen a structure, uh, we just call them groups. Uh, They are mostly family groups. So there are, uh, we have seen a lot of interesting dynamics in the sense, um, the groups typically in these areas don't get too large. You know, six dogs is a big group, maybe with a few pups and then they disperse and break up or, you know, there's a lot of uh, mortality. So dog groups, when they get really big, they split. This is also probably an adaptation because uh, people get more aggressive towards larger packs too much barking, they look fiercer, they look more aggressive. So uh, they, they, the larger packs also receive more uh, negativity from humans. That's one thing. And of course, more competition because uh, the amount of resources available don't increase because the packs increase in size. So they typically migrate and move out to areas where they find resources. That keeps happening all the time. This model sounds similar to wolves and jackals. When uh, there is enough Food sources groups tend to be bigger, but with limited resources, they are forced to split up and move into new areas, forming sort of new groups. So we just call them groups. We have a lot of work on parental care. And we, when we started working on parental care, we also found alloparental care. So there, are, there would be uh, typically if there are, say, two females in a pack uh, and then both females get pregnant because they are promiscuous breeders and uh, both of them give birth. And it's real fun when there are two litters because uh, sometimes it will be staggered and you can make out that the, this litter belongs to this mother. But sometimes they give birth back to back and then all the puppies look the same and... Uh, 
especially if their mothers are sisters and they look the same and then they have you know mated with the same male maybe and then you have you know some eight puppies which look the same and it's very interesting because the pups don't really care who they are uh, suckling from so they will just go and start suckling from any available lactating female and do the mothers understand this which pups are theirs and which aren't the mothers are actually taking care of each other's pups but then we did a much more in-depth study and we actually saw that the mothers do understand how do they show this understanding so when the puppies are very small the mother would come and offer to nurse she lay down and offer to nurse and then there is weaning when the mother will start running away and the pups will start chasing them and it's like a lot lot of fun happening for some 3 4 weeks and then both, both sets give up even when it's not the weaning period what we saw is when her own pups are uh, nursing or suckling from her the duration of suckling is much longer than when other pups are suckling and always when other pups are suckling from the mother so allo suckling is happening the initiation is always from the pup side and the termination is always from the mother's side Oh wow, this is something I've never heard before. When her own uh, offspring are suckling from her, she will initiate and when the pups are very young, the pups will terminate. So the decision of termination and initiation is kind of mutual when it's the mother and her offspring, but when it is other pups, allo suckling happening, it's always that the pups have come and started suckling and the mother eventually realizes and she runs away. She sometimes will literally kick the pups off. So she she definitely knows who her pups are. But this happens a lot. So we actually have a paper on milk theft. So milk theft is actually quite well known in herd animals. Uh, where you know there are a lot of females and their offspring moving in herds so there are, the milk theft, theft has never been reported in non herd animals we were very excited when we saw this and then there are some males not all males who show a lot of care so they will uh, come and regurgitate food they'll play a lot with the pups uh, they'll sometimes even lick the pups clean and uh, guard them when the mother is away and it's very funny because um, i don't have a facility for doing the genetics so i've never been able to do it that's like crying to be done because we think this male is the father but we don't know because uh, all of them have mated multiply but there have been cases when in a, a group there would be one male who would be tolerated around the pups uh, by both mothers and there would be another or more males who will not be tolerated at all even from the same group there have been cases when a male is going and showing care to litters between two groups so it's spending time with the litter in one its own group and then it's also going and spending time with the litter in a foreign group and the mother is not allowing her own group mates to come and uh, inspect the pups so there seems to be a lot of interesting dynamics and of course they know i mean uh, it's very obvious they, they they probably know who the father is otherwise there's no reason why the mother will allow one male from the group to come to the pups and the other male she'll shoo away What a remarkable communal spirit. We published a paper titled The Great Indian Joint Families of Dogs because I couldn't think of a better uh, parallel, you know. We have uh, had this notion of great, big joint families in India where you know there are grandparents and uncles and aunts. I myself have grown up in a family like that. And they seem to be very much like this. So the females who show care to pups are always relatives. So grandmothers, older sisters, aunts, uh we never have seen unrelated females come and show care to pups and when i say show care it's not just the suckling it's also the they will you know protect and they'll play and they'll groom so all of that only related females do and uh, what we call the putative fathers it sounds like really intricate dynamics yeah and the other thing is there's a lot of territoriality so they will uh, gang up together and uh, you know fight with other uh, na- neighboring groups and there's you know aggressive so it's very funny because uh, every night there will be 
howling and barking and all uh, vocalizations going on. And if you go out, you'll see there's a gang standing here and there's a gang standing here. In between, there is a narrow street. And they, it's kind of a no man's land. And they're just standing on the two ends and they're just doing a kind of a vocal uh, match. And then after some time, they'll just go back and go and, uh, go and lie down to rest. <laughs> that makes me think of the West Side Story. So most of the time, they don't really physically fight. But they kind of reinforce their uh, territorial uh, boundaries from time to time. There's, of course, a lot of urine marking happening. But then every night, there would be this vocal tournament. And then everything is fine. Does that happen as well with jackals? I think you have quite a few jackals in India as well. We have jackals in some areas, not in uh, very urban areas. But for example, where I live, and in our institute, it's like surrounded by a lot of agricultural fields and uh, smaller uh, villages. We have a lot of jackals there. And uh, what we think are uh, dog jackal hybrids. Every season, there would be some uh, pups which are kind of in the fringe areas of the campus where people don't typically go. We have a swimming pool and around the swimming pool, there are some kind of land which is not uh, cleaned up. So there's like wilderness growing and we've just kept it like that with the, the natural uh, the biodiversity. So we often see jackals there and uh, we also see puppies which don't look like uh, dog puppies. So they'll have kind of these uh, black-brown stripe kind of patterns on their body and Typically, these will also be more aggressive. And uh, the, when they're pups, their uh, sounds are uh, very different from dog pups. They kind of sound different, but then eventually they start barking like dogs. But then um, the, they are more aggressive. They are less social. They don't uh, like humans much. So uh, we, we have a hunch that these are jackal dog hybrids. And which type of dogs do you have there? Can a term breed be even used or... Are there any local breeds? There are no breeds, but all of them kind of look the same. So there is this mm -hmm. uh, term that's called the Indian native dog or the iron dog. So a lot of people want to call them a breed. So there's uh, this uh, constant uh, push to be, you know, to be identified as a breed. But the, 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 these are very basic dog features. The interesting thing is, there would be people sometimes who would uh, be irresponsible about their pets. So they'll either uh, let the pet dog roam around free or, uh, you know, abandon a pet. So we have actually seen that uh, sometimes there are abandoned pets. And uh, if they're not neutered, then they will actually mate with uh, the stray dogs. And how easy or hard is it to recognize those? There would be sometimes puppies with very f peculiar features, for example, a, n a normal free-ranging dog, and then it has a tail like a feather. Some you know, freak characteristics, or these dogs typically have pointed or half-drooping ears, but then you'll have suddenly a dog with much longer ears. So then you know it's a crossbreed with some uh, other, other breed. But it just takes another round of uh, natural mating to lose all of those characters. Their offspring go back to being the uh, Indian native dog. So how does a typical Indian dog look? Typically, they are either black or brown or, uh, you know, the pale color. And there are often, there's a lot of piebaldness, so patches. And that's very helpful for us because we identify them by their uh, coat color patterns. And... Uh, Typically, a uh, shorter pointed ear, sometimes with a fold, and uh, a short tail, which is curved. That's the typical feature. Uh, statistically speaking, do you have a sense of average weight and uh, longevity? Uh, weight we've never taken, but uh, these would be in the range of, uh, say, they are uh, bigger than poodles and uh, maybe two-thirds of the size of uh, a German Shepherd. Longevity is very difficult because uh, most of them die uh, because of humans. So people poison them, kill them, uh, they die of uh, accidents on roads. Uh, in all of these years, dogs haven't been smart enough to learn how to cross roads perfectly. So sometimes they'll just, you know, get, uh, they get uh, killed by, uh, by buses or cars accidentally because they just happened to run in front of a car just when, you know, it was zooming past. So a lot of deaths happen like that. But we've had uh, dogs live for, what, seven years is kind of old. 
That is pretty short in comparison to pet dogs. It seems that this lifespan is much closer to wolves. So in ecology, we know that any animal which is domesticated and, uh, you know, lives under human care immediately gets a longer uh, lifespan than, so we always say, you know, the lifespan and we say that ecological lifespan. So ecological lifespan is typically always shorter. Talking about life and death, (laughs) I remember in one of your articles, I think it was called Love is in the Air, I read a very interesting observation which relates to mating behavior. Could you maybe tell a little bit about it? Yeah, so we actually discovered this accidentally, that uh, the dogs were showing uh, mating behaviors and mating related behaviors like, you know, sniffing the genitalia, trying to mount, lick each other's genital parts. And uh, my uh, student who was working on this came back and said, you know, this is very irritating. Every time it rains and I cannot go out and take data, these dogs seem to be, you know, making love. And uh, I, I don't understand this. And then I was like, oh, my God, let's go check it out. And then we actually did a very thorough census of this. And we saw that either when it is lightly drizzling in the monsoon, which is now, uh, this is the time when the mating behaviors will start because we have a very long wet season, which is called the monsoon. So these days, sometimes it will be raining for hours at a stretch. So when it's really pouring, they're, of course, not there. But typically when the rain stops, it's cool and it's very humid. Uh, and it's still drizzling, that's when the dogs will uh, be seen uh, trying to mount and uh, showing mating-related behaviors everywhere. And sometimes when it is just beginning to rain, you know, after a hot day and it's suddenly... Uh, so especially, you know, in the ma- months of March, April, we have uh, what we it's called the Norwesters. So there's like a very hot day and then suddenly at four o'clock there's a rain. Uh, And uh, that's when we also see that, you know, the dogs will suddenly get into this mating activities. And uh, we realized that uh, the the data actually showed that there is a very nice uh, correlation. So if you look at the uh, precipitation rates, just after the precipitation uh, peaks in the season, there is about a 15 days offset when the mating behaviors also peak. So we say that there seems to be a very strong correlation between precipitation and uh, mating. And what we think is happening is the males, of course, are always ready to mate, but it's the females who drive uh, the mating, right? So whether they are in heat or not. So I think what basically is happening is that even in the estrus period, the females are not always being very receptive. But when it's raining... The temperature and humidity conditions are uh, very good for uh, saturating molecules, organic molecules, into a smaller space. So dispersal will not happen. So if there are male hormones and then, of course, the female hormones, all of these will hang around wherever they are released. And that probably triggers uh, some behavioral response in the females and makes them more receptive to the males. Yeah, the effects of the mundane things on organisms never cease to amaze me. Of course, this is my theory. There was a time when I was going around and asking all my chemists, you know, I want a small handheld nose. How can you tell me how to get one? Because I want to go around sniffing dog hormones in the air. People tell me, oh, you should do spectroscopy. I'm like, I want to smell it there. How do I do spectroscopy? How do I collect smell from the air, right? It's not so easy. So I want a, you know, an equivalent of a dog nose and an instrument to be able to do that. Man, what a crazy research you have going on there. It, it reminds me of the whole world of odor to which we're not privy as humans. I mean, I wouldn't say that dogs take it for granted because their minds don't work that way, presumably, it's hard to even imagine the information that they count on and have access to. Hearing about that huge familial structure, it kind of makes me wonder where do people come into play. It takes quite a while to socialize dogs to humans, but if the groups are quite close, how do humans even start coming in contact with the pups? Uh, Very early. So uh, typically for the first three weeks of uh, the pup's life, the mother will be very protective and often they, you know, kind of find a hole or something, which is a den, which she will not leave. And those three weeks, uh, she will uh, very rarely allow humans uh, close to the den. Even the humans which are feeding her, 
uh, she will not let them go close to the pups. Then the pups will come out of the den and they will start, uh, you know, moving around in the vicinity. Typically, every group will have a few humans which it gets fed by or, you know, somebody who pets the dogs and they get attached to these people. When the pups are, you know, four, five weeks, six weeks, the mother is uh, quite okay with uh, her familiar humans approaching the pups. So the pups get exposed to humans quite early. And uh, some of our work is actually showing that, for example, we saw that uh, very early in life, like six-week-old pups have this innate ability to follow human pups. Pointing. So you point and they'll go there, which I think is kind of a side effect of the fact that this is also the stage when the mother will take them around and they will go sniff where the mother sniffs. Uh, so probably this kind of an, is an extension of, you know, there's a point and they just go towards whatever the hand follow points. But then when they become juveniles, which is when the weaning has happened three months plus, they become very distrustful of humans. I call this the teenager stage in dogs. So you point right, they'll go left. True, true. <laughs> Certainly many parallels with human developmental stages. I think this is also because in this early period, they not only experience the good humans, they also experience the bad humans. People steal pups, people, kids are sometimes uh, quite obnoxious. For example, my son, he's been fighting with neighborhood kids uh, since he was five years old. People take it like some kind of a game to torture uh, puppies. He will always get into fights and then uh, now he, uh, of course, has his own fights. He's 13. But when he was five, six, I used to have have to you know go and sort it out because he will get beaten up because he was trying to protect a pup they will of often steal puppies from the litter just for fun you know cuddle them for some time and take them off and then just drop them and go home and these puppies get killed because other dogs they're in some foreign territory and they get chased they don't know how to feed so there's a lot of morbidity which is also happening in this stage man how, how does that make you feel i mean as a scientist but also as an animal lover in the one hand, being dog lovers, we, of course, feel very bad about it. But if you take a step back and take a kind of neutral observer point of view, then it's also good for them because there's, of course, you know, they are perfect examples of uh, Darwin's uh, postulates. There's overproduction. There will be, you know, so a litter size could be anywhere between 1 to 15. We have seen one mother give birth to 15 puppies also. And of, of course, there uh, aren't enough resources to sustain 15 puppies in a litter. So of course, they die. Sometimes they die because of human intervention. Sometimes they die because of disease or malnutrition, but they don't survive. So there is, of course, overproduction. But then uh, with all of this, about 19% of the pups in a season survive. And that is also kind of the optimum, if you think about it, for the population to be sustained with the resources which are available. So if tomorrow suddenly everybody became dog lovers and everybody started, you know, allowing the, all the puppies to survive and giving more food to the mothers and all of this, we would eventually have a big problem at hand because of the overproduction of dogs. There'll be just too many dogs around. So in a kind of... Uh, from the from the perspective of a scientist, I think this is a kind of very interesting dynamics which we have established over hundreds of years of evolution that they probably are at an optimum. Yeah, it is indeed really helpful to take that step back and look at the situation, as you say, from a more scientific point of view, because it is really easy to just go with the emotion when you hear that only 19% is the survival rate of the puppies. It does sound quite tragic. Okay, so what is then the contact between humans and dogs when the puppies are bigger? Recent work, which uh, uh, we are, uh, the paper is under review right now, we have, we tried to actually understand this question, where do humans belong in the so societies of dogs? What we saw is that it's, uh, so we did not really look at a particular human because we were doing kind of a top view level of observation where you just observe a focal group of dogs and every time there is a dog human interaction you put it down as a dog human interaction without the identity of the human because the identities would vary depending on what kind of area you are observing there would be few humans who would interact regularly but then there would be a lot of random interactions so we actually created social networks of dogs with one node for the humans 
and what we found is the human node is the most connected node in the entire network so they are basically on an average there are more interactions between a random human and a dog in a group than between two dogs in the same group even more than mother pup interactions so humans mm-hmm. definitely are very important in the social networks speaking about pet lovers do you have the phenomenon of vacationers trying to bring street pups home i mean adopting them this way yeah and also we have a lot of uh, instances of people generally adopting puppies uh, from the road so animal activists and dog lovers actually try to promote this that you know you adopt a puppy take it home don't bring in a, a foreign breed you just adopt a puppy from the streets which is of course good for the pups but then you are taking them out of the population and uh, you're actually creating some level of disruption to the population because they're not in the breeding pool anymore What about the sociability of these dogs? Are there any differences between breed pet dogs and street dogs adopted to become pets? Do you have any data on this? We haven't collected data per se, but I have seen a lot of these uh, throughout my life and even now. For example, two of my students have uh, adopted pets, uh, adopted puppies. They, they have them as pets and uh, they're just pets. I mean, I sometimes feel that these um, dogs are smarter in some ways. They are very convenient pets in the sense uh, they can still fend for themselves if you want them to. If you, if uh, for some reason they go astray, they will uh, find it easier to survive than a breed because they are less foreign to the dogs around in a, in the some sense. Of course there's still going to be a lot of territorial aggression. there would be uh, you know fights and stuff but these puppies if they are not taken up very early if they have been uh, taken uh, in after they have undergone some kind of uh, training with the mother then uh, they retain their flexibility to some extent and, but they are uh, complete pets you know they'll they'll get trained if you train them so they're not really wild at all what about dog shelters do you have many of those in india or is it not really a thing few and uh, even if there are shelters they are not very efficient and do they mainly intake pet dogs or do they also care for street dogs there are shelters where uh, dogs will be lifted off streets because somebody has complained uh, that you know there are too many dogs and they'll be put in some shelter but the shelters are not really good there in india there's there is uh, a lot of uh, legislation so there is an animal rights act and uh, according to that actually there is a law which says if you kill a dog if you beat a dog if you harass a dog even if you displace a dog you could in principle go to jail but of course nobody goes to jail because of this of course animal rights activists use this uh, to scare people but so the only legal way to control the population is uh, neutering so sometimes uh, municipalities would conduct uh, sterilization programs sometimes animal rights activists will uh, conduct sterilization programs because they think you know it's nice that you neuter the dogs and then they are there but they are not increasing in numbers i personally am very against this why is that because uh, if you think about it this is not your pet this is a biological entity out there in its own natural habitat and for a biological entity the final aim for survival or what gives meaning to survival is reproduction and you're basically taking a dog taking away its right to reproduce making it into a living toy of some kind and then you're very happy that there's a dog outside my house i feed it i take care of it and it's there it's surviving and it's giving me joy but you're basically turning a young adult dog into an old dog by this neutering experiment because it's basically it, you're taking it directly from its reproductive age and uh, taking it into a post reproductive age when it is uh, supposed to die so it's in a way very uh, nasty of us humans i think that we think we have the right to decide which animal lives and which animal reproduces and which animal dies so it's another way of infringing on the rights of uh, animals which we don't realize So given that you are a scientist has it changed your own relationship to animals? I mean do you, do you have or have you had any pets? I have always been anti pet. I've never had a pet uh, other than a goldfish which had been gifted to me when I was uh, a teenager. Um 
I always feel I, having a pet is kind of infringing on the rights of animals because then the pet kind of has to live according to my uh, choice and it does not really have a choice of its own. And after working for dogs for so many years, I feel all the more strongly about it because when you know you have uh, taken a, an animal which actually lives in family groups, which has very interesting you know, societal dynamics happening, it has a very vibrant social life. And then you take an animal and then you put it in your house and you say, I'm the family. I, I have often fought with people saying, okay, suppose a, you know, a baboon comes to you and says, okay, I'm going to take your baby and don't worry, I will treat it like family. I'll treat it my own children. I'm sure you're going to be very happy, right? So it's for, for me, it's exactly like that with dogs. So I, I often have this uh, re reply from people, oh, but these are breeds which have been bred by humans. And I'm like, yeah, artificial selection. What right do we have to do it? Just because I want a fluffy dog, I want a cuddly dog, I want a less aggressive dog, I want a, a dog with a blunt nose or whatever obnoxious features. I decide what my dog should look like and that's why we bred them, right? It's horrible. And you say you're an animal lover. So, yeah, I have never had a pet. My son often keeps asking for a pet and I often tell him, you grow up, you become an independent human being when I'm not taking care of you anymore. You have your pet if you want to. I am anti-pet. But wait, you did mention that there are a lot of dogs around you and that your kids pet them and play with them. There are dogs in my garden right now. There's a whole family which has been living here. They create a lot of nuisance. But we put out food for them. We never actively feed them. So there's a pit in my garden. All the leftovers from the meals and some extra always goes into the pit where the dogs come and feed. My kids play with the dogs all the time. They pet the dogs. They give biscuits to the dogs. All of that is fine. But I don't know. They're not our pets. Maybe we are theirs. In the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned that the dogs in the streets get fed with biscuits. Why biscuits? I mean, do you know how that became a popular dog snack? Well, it's cheap. It's easily available everywhere. You get biscuits and packets and, you know, 10 bucks, you get a whole pack of biscuits. Uh, so, And it's a lot of source of glucose for the dogs, I guess. That's a very common thing that people will feed to dogs. So the last question that I have in mind is about the street dogs in other countries. Have you ever done any comparative research with, for example, street dogs in Mexico or in African countries? Not really, because uh, not many people have been studying them. So right now, um, uh, the Vienna group has started working in Morocco. So after they, but they don't do much be behavior and ecology. They are mostly doing social cognition. So um, I'm hoping that we are going to have more people studying uh, free ranging dogs in different other parts. So there were studies uh, from uh, Cafazo and Bonani um, from Italy, and uh, those dogs seem to be slightly different. I kind of spoke to Simona about the history, and she was saying it's more like isolated from the city, and it's a kind of a reserve area where uh, there's a huge pack and people will go drop food on the highway and the dogs will come and feed. So they are not really socialized uh, community dogs. So it becomes very different again because of the way the dogs, uh, the free ranging dogs are treated in different countries. It Uh, they, they become quite uh, different, I guess, again, because they're very flexible. They just adapt to whatever environment they are uh, uh, brought up in. So uh, there is uh, someone who's working on uh, free-ranging dogs in Bali. He was uh, working with uh, Adam McLoshi and now he's uh, on his own. And then, uh, of course, Sarah and uh, Martina uh, in uh, Morocco. So I'm hoping that eventually we will have enough data to kind of do meta-analysis of different populations. But right now, nobody has you know as much data as we do, and it's very difficult to compare uh, across different setups and different methods. So unless we get enough data to kind of say, okay, now let's look at maybe one trait across different studies and then do a meta-analysis. So, Brian, what could be the meta message of this episode? I don't know. Um, buy cookies, go look for street dogs. <laughs> well, that definitely. But I think what stuck with me mostly is that being a street dog is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, 
It all depends on the context. So thanks a lot, Anandita. It was a great conversation. Thank you so much.